last talk of this morning's uh, session, which is given by one of the organizers of this uh, event, Dana uh, Kos Saitis, which started with a bachelor degree in mathematics, continued to uh, Sonic Arts master, then got his PhD from uh, McGill, like many other people in this room. Uh, and is now in Berlin, uh, in, uh, in the audio communication group, um, concerned with uh, the semantic space of musical instruments uh, together with uh, its uh, acoustical correlates. Thank you, Stefan. Um, uh, I, I, I was planning to start with a joke, but you mentioned that I'm one of the organizers. I was planning to say, well, I would like to thank Kai and Harris for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so, um, in, uh, in this talk, I will uh, look uh, a bit at the linguistic expressions that uh, musicians used to describe perceived um, timbr uh, timbral uh, nuances um, in their instruments or between instruments uh, at the same time. So I am primarily concerned uh, in uh, the, the, the kind of timbre um, that musicians um, uh, attend to when they um, differentiate between note like oh I can make this note sound softer or richer or um, when they compare um, different instruments uh, when a violinist compares one violin with another or a clarinetist one clarinet with another um, and uh, I will present some updated and uh, new results uh, mostly from my doc my doctoral and early postdoctoral work um, uh, for uh, with violinists, um, and uh, I will also try to introduce some more theoretical perspectives or uh, lessons learned from that research uh, about um, the semantics of timbre, which is, as Stefan said, uh, my, my current uh, interest. Um, so, um, violinists um, spontaneously describe this um, very subtle. Uh, quality characteristics they perceive um, using a very diverse vocabulary, a read sound, a responsive instrument, uh, even sound across strings and clear notes. Um, so right away I, sh I should uh, emphasize that um, I'm starting to talk about instrument quality and then gradually I will go down to uh, timbre. Um, so, uh, in the context of uh, relating the dynamic uh, the dynamics of the instrument, um, the dynamic behavior with the perceived quality, um, a number of studies uh, have tried to match verbal attributes with features uh, either of structural dynamics measurements, um, this is more like the bioacoustician community, or with um, um, audio features of recorded audio signals, and these are, these are the examples that I'm presenting on the slide. Um, so, uh, Stefan um, and his colleagues, um, they've done a bunch of studies in the late 90s. Um, Sharp <coughs> has a higher lower centroid, narrow is associated with a lower speckle centroid. Um, then uh, uh, the work of Lukasik, um, where there were a bunch of suggestions that um, this, the first sepsal coefficient sort of correlates with the difference between strained and light. Um, or uh, again, the spectral centroid with brightness, um, and um, something interesting that I looked at at some point and I will talk about later, um, that a deep sound has a higher um, first than uh, just in use one and just in use three, um, but a full sound would only have a high just in use one uh, and a low just in use three. Um, a flat sound would have um, a high just in minus three um, and an empty sound would have none of these. Um, for those who are not familiar, the just stimulus model um, is uh, you you take the the ratio of uh, the first the fundamental over all partials that's just in minus one, then uh, the ratio of uh, the second, third, and fourth partials over all the partials. Uh, well, you know the ratio of the amplitudes. 
Um, and that the stimulus 3 is um, the ratio of all partials above the feet um, divided by uh, all partials. Um, it's actually an interesting, I think, um, uh, concept um, and or audio descriptor that hasn't been really looked um, a lot. Um, and some other uh, things here. So a potential issue with interpreting um, the outcomes of these studies is that uh, these descriptors are actually part of a lexicon that is usually taken for granted in perceptual studies. Um, a lot of you um, have talked these days about uh, using um, scales with uh, um, labeled with these descriptors, but how, uh, how perceptually relevant, how psychologically relevant are these descriptors to the participants of our experiments? Um, so, uh, together with uh, uh, Gary Scavone at McGill University, who was supervising my uh, thesis, and Claudia Fritz and Daniel Dubois at uh, LAM in Paris, um, and Catherine Bastavino also at McGill University, we took a bottom up approach. Um, and what we did is um, during violin uh, tests, um, where violinist, violinists were um, doing some preference tasks, then we asked them to verbally describe. Um, their uh, judgments, um, but uh, with very open-ended three questions, they could answer in any way they wanted. Um, so, because we didn't want them to uh, eventually give us the usual adjectives that, uh, that uh, we all work with. Um, so, the, and then we analyzed these um, uh, things with a method based on uh, linguistic analysis associated with uh, psychological theories of perception and sensory categorization. Um, as a first step in translating the semantics of musician expressions into uh, perceptually meaningful descriptors of instrument quality. Um, so, Now, uh, a quick overview, um, uh, it's, uh, so in these studies uh, we had some uh, conditions that were as meaningful as possible to the musician. You can see that it was happening in the dark, they were wearing some dark sunglasses, they couldn't see the, the instruments, um, they uh, could only see the figure, so they were really able to judge without any of the usual biases of if it's an old or a new uh, violin or if it has a, a nice varnish and so on. Um, um, they, um, we gave them time to familiarize. Um, they were able to, define, to develop their own strategy in evaluating the instruments and so on. So really, the conditions under which we collected the verbalizations were um, quite free and spontaneous compared to uh, a more controlled situation. Um, and. Uh, we, we have published analysis of um, uh, uh, consistency and inter-individual agreement um, based on the non-verbal uh, judgments um, <coughs> done together with the Bruno Giordano as well. Um, we saw that people are self-consistent in the preference, but um, uh, and we found a strong correlation between overall binding preference and richness, um, which I will come back to. Um, but there was, of course, a big a big lack of agreement basically between people, um, very uh, something to expect when you deal with quality questions. Um, but the thing is that what we saw is that this is because basically, not because they don't look for the same thing, but because <laughs> the, the different attributes they evaluate, um, the different conceptions of quality in their minds are somehow um, probably uh, different. So. We decided to look at the verbal descriptions to see, understand better how musicians conceptualize um, uh, violin quality. So um, we formed very general questions like how and based on which criteria you made your preference ranking and so on. Um, and uh, basically the analysis has two parts. Uh, it's, a, it's a linguistic analysis and a, a content analysis. So using the inductive principle of grounded theory, um, instead of starting from a hypothesis, we basically really just went into the verbal data and started building a theory from, from that. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is that um, you identify micro-concepts in the, in the language and then you group them together uh, in broader semantic categories. These micro-concepts are unique phrases, as I, we see here in the example, 
Um, they are words or sequences of words that cognitively represent the same uh, basic, the most basic concept um, activated by a stimulus, in this case um, by the sound of the instrument or as we're going to see uh, the vibrations and the interaction with the instrument, um, which might not be... Uh, open. <laughs> Yes, Marcus, we're having that later. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, what was I? Right, so these are like the very basic uh, concepts that might not be meaningful in themselves. So if you, if you see flexibility, or balance, or even or money, it might not make sense on its own, and that's something that we should uh, take, pay attention to. But um, uh, the yield meaning, when they are grouped into broader semantic uh, patterns. Um, so uh, the, then there is the linguistic part, and this is an example where, based on how um, the answers are uh, uh, syntactically uh, constructed. Um, we can make some inferences. inferences. For example, um, flexibility uh, and ease are semantically related here, um, referring to the same thing, and resonance seems to refer to um, maybe some kind of perception of projection. Um, and even sound might not actually mean smooth or soft, but in, in the particular case of the violin, it refers to that there has to be a balance across the four strings and uh, in terms of sound and playability. Um, and um, then uh, these are the categories we, we arrived at. And um, for example, richness um, ended up involving a lot of words that do not necessarily mean something specific, but seem to, uh, to go into a more um, general concept of that the sound has a lot of material in it, so that um, I, as a violinist, can create a lot of different colors with that. And I will come back to that, um, uh, also in connection with uh, something that Asterios mentioned earlier. Then. Uh, Generally, though, I would say that richness seems to refer to, you know, the perceived amount of harmonics, of, of, um, of content in the sound, in the signal. Um, and then we have texture, which seems to be more in how this amount of content is distributed um, along the, the register. Is there, are there more uh, high frequencies, so then the sound will be described as harsh, strident, and so on, or more like mid to low frequencies where um, we have terms like warm, mellow, sweet, brown, smooth, and so on. Um, but of course we also, because it was a playing test, we also got um, descriptions about uh, resonance, uh, I would say more power under the ear, and uh, some perception of projection uh, in the space, um, and then some more like playability really, uh, related um, stuff, and also um, here, there's a little bit of uh, clarity and um, bright, for example, was used often to define a clear sound, a sound that, uh, uh, like when you play very fast in terms of articulation, uh, you don't have any melting of the successive notes, um, uh, or maybe a sound that has no other type of artifacts. So uh, bright, for example, might not be um, necessarily a, a timbre and the script or but more of a playability related thing. Um, so, um, and uh, this, this whole thing, this whole like, um, all these like micro concepts, um, what they show us is that uh, perceived variation, uh, perceived variations in the structure of acoustic or haptic stimuli uh, generated by the same source, the violin in this case, are very subtle, and so their conceptualizations are very subtle. Um, and then we also have the, the, the variability in ex expertise and experience of its individual player. However, the fact that we do see emerging um, patterns, uh, semantic patterns, uh, seems to reflect a shared perception of physical parameter patterns that 
can then allow us to form some uh, hypothesis for understanding psychoacoustical relationships, which is the, the, the end goal. Um, so um, I, I put all this together in some uh, uh, model that uh, I propose, and uh, there is a paper describing all this that will be coming out um, soon at uh, JASA. Um, and uh, basically, starting from the body vibrations, um, they provide both sound and harm information. And then I use very simple, let's say, uh, features. If we focus on the sound, um, you know, there is the perceived number of content in the sound, the, how this is distributed, and then the total amount of energy, um, which then together with the felt vibrations from the instrument uh, gives this other uh, category here. And then I call these two things um, timbre, um, but perhaps uh, tone color or sound color would be a more appropriate term because um, we could argue that um, <coughs> since timbre is a greater um, uh, concept or construct, um, it might even be related with intensity um, and clarity. Um, it's, it's of course a tentative model and uh, uh, it uh, needs to be clarified empirically. Um, but what, what, it, it learned, what we learn from this analysis is that, um, um, as Christoph Reuter uh, brought up yesterday, um, there is indeed, a, when we talk about uh, musical instrument quality in the same way that also Guillaume talked earlier about sound quality, um, there is the concept of sound and there is the concept of, of the musical instrument in this case, like the source that produces the sound or the thing with which something interacts and the sound is produced, in this case the musician. Um, and uh, of course what informs quality evaluation is something uh, quite complex. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you might have noticed that uh, there is a final category that is not included though in this model that has to do with this like more aesthetic, evaluative um, <laughs> dimension that people have and say, okay, this is a beautiful sound, this is a good sound. Uh, and uh, even more importantly, we have the vibrations from the body and also from the bowl string that inform uh, uh, the musician with extra auditory cues that contribute to the perception of sound. Um, so uh, words like ringing, resonating, um, singing sound, all these things really have to do with um, the, uh, how the player feels the violin the moment they hold it and interact with it. Still though, they describe the sound, but do they describe the sound? These are the kind of interesting backs and forths that uh, I have been experiencing um, in, in, this, in this research. And um, now, more, more into timbre, um, what, I guess what I want to give here is that there are descriptions that do not necessarily um, refer to frequency content and this is something that needs to be absolutely clarified before using them in any perceptual experiment. Um, there are words like, uh, I, was, I, I have been looking a lot at uh, Asterios' uh, work and uh, at some point um, I saw that one of the terms used was the term messy, right? So from my research um, I would ask how much does messy or blurry actually refer to timbre or more to articulation? Um, and uh, in relation to Stefan's presentation yesterday um, about uh, musical dynamics and um, timbre, how much um, uh, words like uh, resonant, ringing, lively, uh, what do they really describe? So maybe that's also related to how timbre plays a role in uh, dynamics and loudness. Um, and maybe, as I, as I uh, said um, earlier, maybe timbre here is not the right term. Maybe sound color is more appropriate 
or even um, uh, tone color. Um, we, we had a discussion with uh, Julia the other day, and um, apparently I was I was commenting how we don't really see sound color in research anymore. There were these works in uh, the early um, 80s, um, and uh, then after that, nobody has really used this term anymore. Um, and uh, also, uh, how we considering that the structure of a musical sound, of a musical note, um, there is the attack, there is a steady part. Um, of course, um, I can say that one violin is different from the other if they have different attacks at, uh, and rise times. But maybe that's more something that has to do with um, playing and actually getting the Helmholtz motion on the string. And maybe we should focus more on the steady part um, uh, and, uh, uh, instead of looking at rise time and attack time related features. Um, of course, we should also keep in mind that um, this lexicon that musicians use comes mostly from uh, um, their teachers and it's communicated from teacher to student, between students, between students and instrument makers, um, and so on. Um, I want to very quickly, because um, I'm running out of time, so we, we had another study where people played this uh, scale in the G string um, and they rated the instruments on which um, and uh, then we, um, I looked at spectral centroid and uh, there seemed to be a level of an idea that maybe lower spectral centroid has to do with richness so you know, rich is something that has more low frequency content. And here I try to uh, look at this um, uh, space that uh, Lucas X suggested. So the stimulus one and the stimulus three, flat, deep, full, empty. And um, what I see is that um, the results were a little bit inconclusive. Um, so um, the violin B, the red colored circles, which was always rated as the most rich. Um, was considerably, it had less present upper partials, so a lower uh, stimulus 3 than other violins, but not in all notes, and then there were all kinds of different things. Of course, that might have to do with the particular um, uh, note set. Um, and I do think that the stimulus model is something that has not been looked as much as it should probably. Um, and then, uh, very quickly, uh, something that we have not published yet, um, uh, we, we did a very quick survey uh, with online. Uh, we had 34 uh, violinists asking the question, what does richness mean to you? And again here we see uh, something more interesting actually. So we did get the full deep round dance uh, versus thin weak small. So that was kind of expected. However, we also got mm -hmm. warm, velvety, smooth and mellow. So richness can be used to indicate a full sound, uh, like a sound that has a lot of material to play with, but it could also be in, used in a more darkness, mellowest um, context, that I, I, I want more um, sound in the mid and lower uh, range. Um, people also use acoustical terms sometimes, um, it's very good for us, um, and of course they also brought this interaction, so by, by richness they want an instrument that has the capacity to produce a lot of colors, and this definitely does not only refer um, uh, to sound. And maybe that's why also Asterios uh, found uh, less consistent um, results with uh, terms like uh, richness and fullness. And I have to please conclude. Um, so, um, where do we go from here? Uh, so, um, I think we should uh, um, look more into individual uh, semantic timbre spaces. So we should look at each instru instrument separately. There is the violin timbre, there is the piano timbre, there is the saxophone timbre. Like we, we need to look uh, how uh, the particular musician communities um, linguistically express their perceptions there. Um, and perhaps we will um, uh, we can hypothesize that there is also a more a, a larger common framework. Um, that all musicians share. And um, then perhaps this extends beyond music, musical instruments into voice and uh, everyday sounds or electroacoustic sounds. 
Um, and uh, finally, I'm grateful for Taffeta who mentioned the, uh, the color study. Um, that it's, I think it's an amazing uh, work. Um, and uh, that uh, perhaps there is an even universal framework in how we semantically describe sound that goes beyond musicians and beyond um, languages and has to do more with uh, the, um, uh, as Zachary Wolman calls it, the embodied cognition of sound. Thank you. that is in contact with 
the body of the player. So the body vibrates with the instrument. And if you change players, there is a different vibrating body emitting the sound. Did you look into that? How different uh, players influence the, the timbre or this, how this plays into the vocabulary they use? Or does it even make sense to wonder about that? I mean, no, 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 it, it does make sense. Um, uh, we, we also got this, uh, this, this type of question in, in the review of this uh, paper. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't really looked at the uh, individual players. Um, the only thing we, we did at some point that was uh, a couple of years ago at ICMPC in Thessaloniki. Um, um, at that point, I had a slightly different categorization scheme because um, there had been several iterations before arriving at this final model. Um, and um, there we, uh, we did look very quickly at consistency more or less, like whether people were consistently, because in these studies uh, players came uh, twice, a few days apart, they were doing a lot of trials within each session because we were looking at self-consistency to begin with. So I, and we were collecting this verbal data constantly. Every time they did the task, they had to describe. So I looked at, at even if the language changes, and yeah, it was slightly um, changing. Sometimes they would use other words, but uh, usually um, every player had, they were consistent in the kind of concepts they had, but there were differences, of course, and also differences in priority. Because they talk a lot about like this violin uh, is I don't know good or bad or whatever and playing technique, but um, I don't know if they consider like uh, players with similar uh, techniques or expertise. Uh, if just I play the same instrument and then you play it and it sounds different, is yeah, it because yeah. we have? It's, it's a very interesting question, but I, I haven't really looked at it with this new um, categorization and uh, I will try to do that at some point. Um, there is, of course, yeah, I do expect, uh, there are different schools, for example, like one teacher follows a specific vocabulary thing um, and another teacher probably follows a different. Okay, thank you. Maybe one last question, because uh, otherwise uh, the lunch break will be a little short. And, um, please. Maybe um, a small um, comment or suggestion. Maybe it would be good to put the players into the role of listeners and then ask them to categorize this, this song. Um, actually, um, what happened here, um, uh, in this study, we had both cases. So first, they played this, not this scale, and they had to judge the instruments on richness. Then we recorded them um, playing this thing, and then each player also okay. listened. Sorry. They came. Mm -hmm. No, it's fine. They came for a second session where they listened to their own recordings yeah. and redid um, okay. the evaluations. And there were, of course, some very interesting uh, <laughs> differences. So um, <laughs> some people make completely different evaluations based yeah, on listening rather than playing. Uh, there is a, a 2015 paper in Akhtakuska where I discuss this in more detail. Mm -hmm.